That is the title of my sermon today, The Weight of Glory. I want to say it sounds better in Hebrew, the kabot, the glory of God, the kabot. And so, um, let's just go a little bit deeper into, but at the things which are not seen. How are you supposed to take notice of the things that are not seen? So for that I want to go to Romans 1 verse 20. For the invisible things of him since the creation of the world are clearly seen. Now that's an interesting scripture. It says you can see the invisible things. So, you know, when I read something like that, I ask myself, how? How can you see what is invisible? Being perceived through the things that are made, even His everlasting power and divinity, that they may be without excuse. So, the invisible is clearly seen how? Through being perceived. And so this morning we need to perceive things. Because one day when we stand before God, we will be without excuse. I'm telling you folks, the invisible things can speak to you. It, it speaks to me. When I look at the stars, it speaks to me. When I stand on the beach and a beautiful day, and the waves are coming in, and there's just a gentle breeze, and it speaks to me. And this is what the Word is saying, that there's invisible things that you can't see, but because of what has been made, the things that you can see, it's explaining to you that there's something more. So, what is the weight of God's glory? The glory of God, or the kabot, is the weight of all that God is. Everything that God is. Everything He has, all of His wisdom, all of His power, all of His majesty, all of His wealth, all of His strength, all of His authority, His excellence, and His holiness. That, together, is what makes up the weight of God. And that's a weighty thing, let me tell you. So, if we want to look at some of these and we say, Wisdom, how wise is God? 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So, the smartest man on planet Earth, on his best day, is not even as smart as God when he's been foolish. That's basically what that's saying. Who, who thought that God would sometimes be foolish? Maybe he has a day where he just thinks I'm going to joke around a little bit today or whatever, I don't know. But the foolishness of God is wiser than man. And then we can look at the power of God. In Ephesians 1.19 it says, And what the exceeding greatness of His power to us world, who believe according to that working of the strength of His might. God's power is far above all rule, all authority, any other power, any other dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. The power of God by far supersedes every other power. There's no name that can be named that comes close, not even close, to the name of Jesus. The next one I want to look at is how majestic is God? What does majesty mean? Majesty, uh, the meaning of majesty is mightier than everything else. That's what majesty means. 
Psalm 91, uh, 93 verse 1 says it like this. Jehovah reigneth, he's clothed with majesty. Jehovah is clothed with strength. He hath girded himself therewith. The world also is established that it cannot be moved. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Folks, it says he has girded himself therewith. He puts on majesty like you put on a shirt or trousers this morning. And it means mightier than everything else you can think of. That's what majesty is. And he wears it like a garment. How wealthy is God? Psalms gives us just a clue in Psalm 50 verse 10. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I wish I could read, take the time to read that whole psalm to you. But that's just a, enough right there. Every beast of the forest belongs to God and the cattle of a thousand hills will actually, it's truth be told, the cattle of every hill belongs to him. It's just the psalmist didn't quite know how to say that. Every bird, every fish, everything that he has created is his. Makes sense, doesn't it? If he created the gold, surely it belongs to him. I know some companies think it belongs to them, but it belongs to him. God is exceedingly, exceedingly wealthy. And what we think of as wealth is puny compared with our God. The next one I want to look at is uh, the strength of God. Who is our strength, I want to ask you this morning. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and our strength. <coughs> what is a refuge? A refuge is a safe place. You can hide in God, and when you're hiding in God, He becomes your strength. You don't have to stand on your own abilities. He's a very present help in trouble. If you have any trouble, he's a present help in trouble. And Gerald was just testifying how quickly God came through in his situation. Folks, I, I know some of you think your parents were disciplinarians and they had authority in the home or, or whatever. But I want to tell you who holds the ultimate authority. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came to them and spake unto them, saying, All, not some, not a little bit, all authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. Folks, the person that has authority has the final say. They have the final say. They have the final say over your life. They have the final say over your situation. And his name is Jesus. He has authority. <coughs> How excellent is God. Psalm 8 verse 1. O Jehovah our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who hath set thy glory upon the heavens. He is excellent. His glory is upon the heavens. He's a glorious, glorious God. There's a weightiness to the glory of God. How holy is God. Revelations 4. 4 verse 8 can help us with that. And the four living creatures, having each one of them six wings, are full of eyes round about and within, and they have no rest day and night, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, 
who was and who is and who is to come. Folks, these powerful angels can do none other than bow before God and cry out in, in strings of three, Holy, Holy, Holy. Holy, Holy, Holy. Why? Because He is holy. You know, if you understand holiness, it means really unique, different, special. And that's what God is. The weightiness of God, the weight of His glory, would have crushed even a great man of God like Moses. And that was why when God revealed some of Himself to Moses, Moses wanted to see God, but God was smarter than Moses. He said, man, if you see me in all of my glory, that's it, ticket's over, you're done. And I've still got to work for you to do. So what I'll do is I'll just pass by. Obviously God was there all the time in the spirit, but in the physical, he said, I'll let a physical manifestation pass by. But what I'll do, I will cover your eyes so that you cannot see. And then as I go past, I'll allow you to catch a glimpse of me disappearing off into the distance. And that was enough to make Moses glow like a torch. The weightiness of God. You see, we fear so many things in life. And we have so many ideas and plans. And <clears throat> we try and... When you come to that understanding of who God really is. And my prayer today is, Lord, reveal yourself even more to me. Because there's no safer place to be than in Jesus. Psalm 19 verse 1 says it like this, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. What does that mean? Firmament, it's talking about like space, the stars. And you look at the stars and you see his handiworks. Ron and I love to swim in the cool of the evening before we go to bed. And there's nothing better for me than to just stand in that cool water and look at the stars. And sometimes a cloud or two blows past and I just... I stand there in awe and I just think, how great is God? How great is God? It carries on in verse 2. It says, day unto day uttereth speech. Come on, guys. I didn't know that a day spoke to you. And night unto night showeth knowledge. Day unto day uttereth speech. What does that mean? Can a day really speak to you? Can a night show you knowledge? I'm telling you, it speaks to me, folks. When I uh, just drive over the bridge here towards church and I look at the beauty of the mountain, it speaks to me. It's saying something to me. You know what it says? It says, God is great. God is great. Can a night show you knowledge? You better believe it. I'm not smart enough to study the stars, guys. There's too many of them. I'll get stuck about on the third one. Some people know all the names of the stars. It speaks to you. So, I have a question for you this morning. This God that is so weighty with glory. Remember, what is the glory of God? It's the weight. Uh, uh, what is the weight of the glory of God? It's the weight of everything that God is. And I've touched on just some of the attributes of God. And even one of those is enough to crush you. But you put all of that together... 
there's a weightiness to God. And if that weight were to come in its full revelation in this church right now, you'd all be raptured on the spot. Your physical body cannot take that level of presence of God. And so we pray, come Lord Jesus, but come so that we can manage it. We're not yet ready to be raptured. But can we, in some way or other, display God's glory? Because God left us here as humans on earth to not just survive. He left us here to thrive in the midst of every problem that the world can throw at you. He left us here to display His glory, to be little Christs, as it were, Christians, little Christs, representatives of the glory of God, ambassadors of the greatness of God. And he wants us to show forth his glory. So you say, well, how can little me show forth his glory? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you. Number one, and I dealt with this last week, but I want to touch on it again. Confession of sin. When we confess sin... It shows forth the glory of God. Something happens in the uh, supernatural realm. And wherever you've read through history of revivals, there's been a repentance of sin. People humbling their hearts before God. I want to tell you, folks, our country is in a mess. They tried to even poison the head of ESCOM. You can't figure this out. We're right now sitting in load shedding with no power because they're in such a mess and they don't care. They will even poison the head of ESCOM because they want to keep on stealing. And, And corruption has become endemic in this nation. But you you know where it starts? It starts in the church. Even in the church there's corruption. Be with me. I've heard lovely Christian people phone their bosses and say, uh, Pastor, uh, or not uh, not Pastor, boss, I'm uh, sick today. I won't be able to come in. No, they're going to a special conference. Yeah? You see, if there's corruption in the church, how can you not expect corruption in government? Can I ask you, just for one second, to stand with me and let's confess the sin of corruption over this nation. We, the church, come on, stand, folks. Lord, I confess corruption in this nation. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to help us as the church to show forth your glory of honesty and integrity, uprightness. Forgive us for being slack in this area. Forgive your church, Lord, because as the church goes, so goes the nation. And the nation is going to the dogs unless God deliver us. And so we confess the sin of corruption today. You can stay standing with me for a moment because I want to move on to Uh, Point two, how can we display God's glory? By forgiving others. And right where you're standing, I want you to pray, Lord, as I forgive others, forgive me. By the same measure that I forgive others, forgive me. Come on, Lord Jesus, forgive me by that same measure. Not a penny more. As I will forgive others, forgive me. See, people misunderstand forgiveness. They think 
if you forgive somebody that you have to be their best friend. No, I'll forgive a snake for biting me, but I'm not going to get back in his cage again. You understand? Amen. People don't understand that. You can have a pure heart of forgiveness, forgiven, it's dealt with, but don't play with the snake anymore. He will bite you again. Okay? Unless he gets delivered, that's a different story. Cast those fangs out of him, then you can play with him if you like. Lord, I forgive everyone that's ever hurt me so that I can experience the full forgiveness of God. Trusting God. How can I display God's glory? When I trust Him, I show my faith in Him. Nothing pleases Him more than when we trust Him. Worry is not of God. I'm glad you're standing because you can pray as you're standing. Lord, forgive me for being a worry pot. Forgive me for my fear. We carry so many fears. Fear of darkness. Fear of being alone. Fear of crowds. Uh, man, it goes from one extreme to the other. People walk around full of fear because they don't know the weightiness of God. They don't understand who God is. Right now, under the sound of my voice, repent, say, God, help me to trust you. We get discouraged when things don't work out. I had an appointment with the doctor and then they phoned me to say the doctor couldn't make it and I was a bit irritated. And so then they found me back a, a day or two later and said another doctor could see me. And I thought, well, that's fine. I'll see this other doctor. It was God's setup all along. This doctor was much sweeter to me. When, when he was finished seeing me, he did a whole lot of tests that each cost a thousand rands each or whatever. And he walked over to the secretary and he said to her, it's just an appointment. Ha <laughs> ha! That scan that cost a thousand rands. He forgot about that. Everything else he did, he forgot about that. It's just an appointment. You see, we get so stirred up by things going wrong. But if you believe that God works all things out to those that are called according to His purposes, trust God. I rebuke lack of faith in God off of our lives. In every area, trust Him. Lord, help me to trust You. Lord, I repent of doubt. I repent of worry. I repent of thinking that You're not big enough for my situation, like my situation is so special that not even the weightiness of God. I repent of that wrong, stinking thinking. And I pray I tell you, God is doing something in this atmosphere. Trust God, folks. The next one is produce fruit. How can we display God's glory? We display God's glory when we produce fruit. And you might say, well, I'd like to produce fruit. How do I produce fruit? You produce fruit when you abide in the vine. Have you ever walked through a vineyard? And listened to the vines groaning, I must produce, I must produce, I must produce. You, have you heard them? Have you seen them trying to squeeze out grapes? It doesn't happen like that. A vine that is connected to the root and it's in the ground and it's been watered, it brings forth grapes. I want to tell you, when you abide in the vine, you will bring forth fruit. And when you bring forth fruit, it speaks, it makes a declaration of the glory of God over your life. And we need to have the glory of God on our face.